Well, hi everybody and welcome to our kickoff session. It is um, September 8th, 2014, I think it should be, hopefully. And uh, my name is Jennifer Madrill. I'm here in Chicago, Illinois, and we have several of the students with our new cohort of service learners with um, Grace Centers of Hope. We have Kim Phillip here, and I believe Courtney may be hanging around in the background somewhere. And then also Bonnie Shelnut, who is a volunteer with Grace Centers of Hope and has a very, very strong instructional design background and is very much considered our subject matter um, expert on the on the service learning project. We also have Dr. Jill Stefaniak who's sitting down in uh, Virginia at Old Dominion University and uh, she will probably be jumping in as we go through some of the slides today. But really the main focus and thrust of our session today is to welcome everybody officially to the service learning project face to face and hopefully you'll see the little video of me and some of the students uh, um, popping in as we go. Um, and then also just to really give Kim the opportunity to take the floor and give us a good sense of the context of their education program, um, give us a better idea of their learners, how she and Courtney are doing as they transition to the new format of the GED, which is really why we're here to help them um, to move from the 2003 version, I think it was or maybe 2002 version of the GED now to the 2014 version. And so uh, without further ado, uh, if you can hopefully let me know in the text chat, there's a text chat window running on the right side for me on my screen. I think it's on the same for you. If you can't hear me or see me, just let me know in the back channel and, and I'll try to make some adjustments. Um, but I just wanted to have a couple screens here of uh, start out every session and we end it pretty much with a thank you. We're all volunteers here. Just to clarify, everyone's volunteering their time on this, the facilitators, the students, and Bonnie. And Kim and Courtney very often will join us in the evening on their free time. So um, it's just a huge thanks to everybody. Um, we were talking before the session started. We don't really exactly know how this works virtually. I've never met Kim, Courtney, Bonnie. I've only met Jill a couple times face to face. Somehow this all this weird kooky virtual experience somehow uh, manages to work. And we just really want to thank everybody for their pioneering efforts to, um, to give this a try. So um, as a, a bit of an, an agenda, as I said, I wanted to spend a little bit of time introducing all the different team members, whether on the client side or, or here on the service learning side, and also spend some time on logistics. So making sure everybody understands where they should be going to find things on the website, making sure everybody's comfortable and has started on the jumpstart orientation, and um, spend a little bit of time confirming what the deliverables are and what's expected of the service learners as we run through this process. And then at the very end, we'll just spend a little bit of time talking about what to expect in the upcoming weeks. So um, as I mentioned in the Jumpstart orientation, uh, Kim is the uh, Director of the Education and Career Development within Grace Centers of Hope. She works alongside Courtney and uh, Bonnie is the volunteer um, who works with them as well. And so if you've noticed as you've gone through the Jumpstart orientation, hopefully um, there's a section there for frequ or, um, not frequently asked questions, but rather questions and answers. If you have any questions that aren't covered in the Jumpstart orientation, feel absolutely comfortable to post either the, to the Q&A to the facilitators or to the Q&A to um, the Grace Centers of Hope because Kim has specifically asked to have some type of venue for her to be able to have interactions with, um, with all of you as students and very much step in as that role as the subject matter expert. And so that's really what that forum is all about. So if as we're going through anything and you, you're not sure please don't hesitate to reach out and ask somebody a question. There's either that or you can certainly send emails to either um, Jill Stefaniak or myself. We didn't give out the, the emails for Kim and Courtney. They're just two people and we're about 20 when you add us all up. So if please, if you could um, continue to use the discussion forms for your initial questions or your emails to the facilitators and we'll just make sure that we loop Kim and Courtney in but rather than trying to inundate them with a bunch of um, individual emails. And so this is way too small, I'm sure, for anyone to see, but there is a, a full roster on our website at studio.designersforlearning.org. Um, but just to give everybody a context of, of what's involved with this whole process, we have 13 students and 14 faculty sponsors and advisors from, um, and I, I don't believe we have any overlap this time, so it's from 13 completely different colleges and universities. Last year we had um, some multiple participants from universities. So this is pretty cool just for all of us to have this really unique opportunity to come together 
um, from different programs. And it's a challenge and it's also an opportunity for us as we get going here to hear all the different ways people do things and what they call things and design plans and what have you. And so um, it's just a really neat opportunity, I think. I've never experienced something like this where I've been able to work with um, with students and faculty from so many different um, universities and colleges and different programs. We have some folks with a little bit more of an emphasis in, in the HR area and um, some more that are uh, focused in on instructional design. So again, just kind of pat yourselves on all of us on our backs to say, wow, this is cool that we're pioneering and trying this because it, it, again, it's a pretty unique experience, at least for me personally, and I, I, I would assume for a lot of us that are joining. Um, and then just to give you a, a, just a little bit of a sense what's going on in the back room here with the Designers for Learning. It started out last semester, it was me, myself, and I, and I've been able to twist arms, and as I mentioned, Jill's going to be facilitating this session with us here. Um, we've also taken the next step and formalized Designers for Learning as a nonprofit organization, and so you may see um, Jason Ingerman's name pop up, or as well as um, Dr. Monica Tracy from Wayne State University. They are our co-directors on the nonprofit very much involved in kind of the back room of, of the direction for Designers for Learning. Our goal very much for the future is to be able to go out and get grants to support our research that we do around service learning, instructional design, um, is also um, just in, being able to increase the, our ability to facilitate more projects. So um, you may, again, like I said, you may see some of these names popping up um, as well as we're going through. And Jill, I, I, maybe I'll just take a second. Did you want to say anything at this point in terms of uh, your introduction to the to the project, to the say hi to the students or anything? Well, just um, hi to everybody who's been able to join us today and for those of you that are going to be watching the recording. Um, I just know I think both myself and Jennifer were both really excited to be working with, um, with you all this fall um, and really hoping to see what we can develop for Gray Centers of Hope. And so you'll probably be seeing lots of emails and correspondence for me and Jennifer throughout the fall. And don't hesitate to contact us if you have any questions or any hiccups along the way. We're here, we're here to help you. And um, I just want to spend a little bit more time on logistics before we turn everything over to Kim. I'm assuming, and like I said, there's a text chat here on the right for those that are, are with us locally. If not, please send us emails if you're having any trouble whatsoever with the website. It's brand new. We just launched it this fall, and so I know that there are probably some broken links. And it's I'm the web developer, and I have zero training in it. So <laughs> please be kind, but also please let me know if you do find anything that's goofy. Let me know. Please start utilizing the discussion forums, as I mentioned. Um, and then also, I, um, I, I'm assuming people know this, but it's never, it never hurts to reiterate some of these things. As Jill and I have macro updates, we will be using email, but we will also be using the news feature. So if you look at the navigation bar on the studio.designersforlearning.org, there's a link that says news, kind of like a blog feature. So if we have a webcast scheduled or if there's something that we just want to pass out or remind people of due dates or whatever, it would be there. There's also an official calendar that's also linked in the navigation bar called schedule. So if you could just kind of make it a habit to check the news and the schedule sections just to make sure you're aware that um, of things that we may be adding. It comes up a lot. This is a virtual experience. Unfortunately, we don't have the opportunity during the week ever to get together face to face. So we have to kind of rely on these crutches as ways to communicate. So again, email is a biggie, uh, the news feature in the schedule, just kind of keep an eye on those things. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the discussion forums unless anybody had any questions in the text chat, you can po post them there, but it should be fairly self-explanatory what they are and, and um, where you can post things. The uh, Jumpstart orientation runs through the 15th. I think most people for that I've spoken with are at least starting it, at least enough to know to start using the introduction to make your first post. We've actually received our first reflection, so we have kind of a, <laughs> a go-getter, a type A personality out there who's already turned in uh, his first reflection. And um, so the idea is after you've completed reading the materials, uh, the video that Jill made and looked through some of the resources, that when you're finally done in section six, there'll be a button you push. It will take you to a form you fill out, which is your first designer reflection. As I said, we, we ran this uh, pilot in the spring, and one of the critiques from the students has had as well as I had as a facilitator, I really felt I lost touch with students. Um, and I think they felt at times they lost touch with me. And so we're hoping that using these designer reflections, and this is very much Jill's uh, initiative that she's driving, 
um, which is a great enhancement, will help you to be able to communicate when you're in need of help or when things are going well, just let us know. And then in, in turn, we're able to re re read those, review them, and then give you additional feedback where you may need it. So we really are not inserting this into the workflow as some type of busy work, but truly we really think this is an additional lifeline in this virtual experience, kind of a field journal where you're able to go and, and post to us, let us know how things are going, and we're able to give you um, some feedback. So we do ask that you please, uh, there are six of them that we're asking you to complete. If you feel like doing more, I guess you can do more, but at a minimum, when we have them set up in the schedule at certain points in time, if you could send those to us um, on a timely basis, we'll be able to review them and give you the feedback you need. And uh, any, any more comments on that, Jill, before I move on as far as the reflections? No, I, I, think, I think you've got it covered. Okay. Okay, and so now I'm officially going to stop talking at minute 11 here. <laughs> and and uh, Kim, you have the floor for as long as you want it. Uh, these are some of the things that I've asked Kim to cover. Again, if you, as the students that are on the call right now or faculty advisors, anyone who's, who's joined us, please use the check chat on the right if you have specific questions for Kim. And if we need to, we can you know, fire up your webca webcam or mic if you'd like to ask. Um, audio questions as well. Um, but with that, Kim, uh, why don't you go ahead and take, a, take it away and start out maybe by giving us a sense of how things are going with this new transition to the new GED. Well, it has been an experience for both um, Courtney and I. Um, mm -hmm. there was, we, we felt like there was not a whole lot of direction given to specifically what was going to be on the changes for the GED. So we are really excited. Currently we have 15 students, some of them new, some of them have been here for as long as six months with us, and we just sent three of them to take their first section of the GD. Uh, we have two of those going tonight to take their second mm -hmm. section, so um, we, feel, we feel good, like we're kind of in the right direction. Mm -hmm. We're directionally correct, I always say. <laughs> Um, because you know, they're they're obviously getting the information they need to pass the test. The um, we have not had anyone test in science yet, and we have not had. Um, I think that's it. We've not had anyone test in science. So, I think our biggest frustration with this change has been that we have two online resources that we're kind of toggling our students back and forth to, as well as about three GD books that have recently been published for these changes. Um, and when Designers for Learning said they wanted to do this again, I was jumping up and down, and so was Courtney with Glee, um, because there's really six areas where we feel like none of, the, um, none of our resources are adequately covering this. So we're kind of just piecing everything together as we go and uh, pulling off of different websites and trying different worksheets and creating lessons. And um, so those will be the six that Jennifer has up on the screen right now. So we're super um, excited about that. Overall, um, our education program, when someone comes into Grace Centers of Hope, they usually uh, have been drug or alcohol addicted. Right now, our uh, biggest issue is um, heroin addiction. So we have a lot of younger clients coming in. Uh, that I would say that's the majority of our population right now is, is younger clients who have not completed um, high school because they were probably um, either had severe ADHD and were not able to function well in a traditional classroom. So they opted to drop out of high school um, or they had an addiction issue early on and dropped out of high school because of that. So they're pretty, I would say, as far as our learners, they're pretty tech savvy, uh, the majority of them. We do have a couple of older, um, older learners right now in our classroom, and we're working through the technology with that. Um, we have some decent online resources that we're using to teach them how to type and how to navigate and things um, to that nature. Uh, I'm kind of jumping around here. Our GD prep process, when we get a client in and we know that they have not obtained their high school diploma or their GED before coming to us, they are automatically enrolled in our GED program. 
Um, we give them a TABE assessment, which is a standardized grade equivalent test to find out where they are. I would say the majority of our learners um, are sixth grade and up. We have found that we've not been really successful with anyone who's under that. And um, so we've, we've really been focusing on those folks as far as focusing them on GED prep. So when they come in, um, they're given an orientation. They are introduced to our two online resources as well as given a GED book. And uh, most of their homework is out of that GED book. And the time that we're with us, in, that they're with us in class, they are usually working through our two online resources. We have uh, right now five tutors who come in and will work one-on-one -on -one with the students. We have found that the biggest need that we have for them uh, to work with our students is in math. And I would say the second one is in science. So that's, that's primarily um, the tutors that we look for that have proficiency, you know, up to, up through high school in those two areas. Um, our needed instructional materials, that's what Jennifer has up there. As I had said, um, we have science where um, the scientific method, we do not have a good resource for that. And most of our um, writing that the students need to do in a short answer response, as well as some of the other questions, have to do with the scientific method. That second unit two there on science, that topic, designing a scientific experiment, we have found that many times um, they either have not been in engaged when they were in school in science, uh, or that you know that they've just kind of forgotten how to do that, you know that that's something that is taught to students as young as in fourth grade now is how to set up a science experiment, and so you know that's that's been a huge um, learning curve that we've had to go through in what we need to do with them, and as I had said, we just don't really have any good resources for those. Um, Unit three on writing. Writing is their, is their other really tough subject. They have been maybe, they've maybe learned how to creatively write, but to specifically answer, answer to the GED standards of understanding what a prompt is exactly asking them to do and then to write around that. Um, you know, we're, we're having to teach them how to we call it unpack a prompt, and that's actually like the GED term for it. Unpack a prompt and then create an outline around that. That unit four, we have no resources that we have found that are uh, about paraphrasing and summarizing, uh, how to use quotes, those kind of things. Many of the resources that we find around writing, around science at this point, at this basic level for these things that we're asking um, are written so that at, at like maybe, um, you know, an elementary school student would find interesting. But the fact that these are adult learners, you know, they, they really, it, it's, it's almost insulting to them when they go in and where, you know, they have these little cute figures up on the top of, you know, this little guy and he's teaching them how to, you know, do an experiment with bubble gum or something. Um, and really what they need is to have, have this written at an adult level. So that's, you know, that's some of the other reason that we really need these, um, these topics designed or these units designed for the, specifically for the adult learner. Um, that unit five and six, the reason we have math and science there is because Combinations and permutations and probability show up a lot in both of those areas on the GED testing, and the they need a lot of practice on this. We, they do have some learning that's in the um, the two online resources that we have, but it's it's not enough that we found that it's it, it's very complicated for them to wrap their head around that. 
So um, those are our six units that we really need the most assistance with. Um, I really, you know, I just thank all of you so much for your time. And I know that you could be doing other things with your time, and I just so appreciate the fact that you're willing to um, jump in and to, and to work on these things. As Jennifer said in the introduction, Courtney and I are both happy to um, be subject matter experts and answer any questions you may have as you go through this process in, in designing these uh, instructional materials. And, um, and either Courtney or I uh, have an education background. So my background is in training and development, and Courtney's background is in social work. So. Um, for those of you who said that you have not had any background in this, that's okay because we haven't either. So we feel like we're all big one happy family and we kind of go through this all together. You know what, um, um, Jennifer, I don't know if there's anything else you want me to specifically speak to. Yeah, this is a, probably a good time. That final bullet point on this slide, I don't think I mentioned it, um, but you've got the six units. And then last semester, uh, we, we tried something yeah. where we had, it, Kim was just learning what the requirements were on the GED test. Had, and I don't think at that point when we first were laying out the program, you'd even really um, taught any of the students the new material. I think it was so like last fall, you know, about a year ago now. And Correct. So, so we pretty much let the students pick the topic areas. And so they did a pretty good job hitting on three areas. And um, now that we've had a chance over the summer to digest what, what students have prepared, unfortunately, that group didn't have a style guide. They didn't have an orientation. I'm not sure how they were able to complete anything because they were just pretty much to, you know, sent out and said, please go design some instruction for us without a lot of guidance. And so... Um, through the process of the summer, uh, Dr. Stefaniak had her students over the summer do an evaluation of three of the units. In addition, Bonnie Shelnut has gone through three of the units this, that the students worked on. And so what we'd like to do is have this group, um, you have the opportunity to volunteer if you'd like to take a crack at these, is to take the materials um, that were developed, three of the units that were developed in the spring, and um, adapt them. We can now have a style guide in place. And we also then have the feedback from the, uh, the reviews and the evaluations that have been done. So then when we're all done, we'll have a total of nine units um, ready and available for Courtney and, and, um, and Kim to use. So again, that's something you, when you do your reflection six, if that's something you might be interested in. The, the nice thing about it, I'll try to sell it a little bit. The nice thing about it is you may not have to do as much time digging into looking what the, the source material is. A lot of the content is already there. It's just a matter of I'm refining the actual instructional strategies and um, changing some things around. So there's my little mini sales pitch for <laughs> considering those uh, as well. Um, Jill, did you have any questions for Kim, or did any of these students have any questions for Kim uh, on the on the project? I don't think anyone's using the text chat yet either. Um, okay, Kim, why don't we you and I go through these next couple slides together? Um, because I think this now gets a little bit more into the details of what's needed beyond the, t the subject matter and the topics, but just kind of bigger picture things to keep in mind. The way, as you mentioned, the students come in, they take the TABE test, and then you start having them work through the units. And you said in general, those sessions last about an hour at a crack. Is that right? And so we've, we've always been targeting to keep the lesson to an hour or less, right? Yes, absolutely. You know, I've, I've if, if they're on one topic, because we have four subjects to get through, uh, if they're on one topic for more than an hour, um, they, they really lose interest in it. So I think one hour is a great target. And so from a design standpoint, I know this all right now probably sounds really overwhelming when you start looking through all the material that potentially could be on a GED test. You start looking at the training manuals, the test, whatever. But just to kind of for you personally as a design as designers for the students, kind of take a breath, step back, and say, okay, really, what I'm focusing on is a one-hour lesson, and you'll pretty quickly realize, I think, once you start digging into the content, there's not all that much you can cover in an hour because we really want you to spend a lot of time thinking about the instructional strategies. So, how are the learners going to engage with the content? Are you going to give them? How are you going to give them ample opportunity to practice the material to give them some opportunities? for um, you know, assessment and feedback. Uh, so when you start layering in all those components, it's a, it's a much more manageable uh, endeavor for you as an instructional designer than it might seem at first. And we actually had that 
in our first reflection that came back, the student was a little bit apprehensive about, wow, this sounds like a, a big project to, to tackle. And actually, when you kind of break it down into an hour chunk of material, it's not quite as daunting when you think about it that way. Um, and then, Kim, if you could spend a couple seconds also talking about this idea of the, how the learners work independently with a lesson, but they also do then have the support of a tutor who's either um, you or Courtney or a volunteer. And if you could kind of walk us through a little bit about how that process works, that would, I think would be helpful. Okay. Um, as I said, we have the two online learning resources that we use right now, which is Study Island and Aztec. And I sent the, I, I have set up um, links and usernames and passwords that I sent to Jennifer this morning um, for Aztec and Study Island so that uh, you can go in and kind of fool around in there and see what we already have. So the, when the student comes in, they usually, Courtney usually assigns them to work in either one of those programs. And um, Aztec has an audio part as well that goes along with it, whereas uh, Study Island is just they uh, read a lesson and they go in and that's pretty much just going in and taking some quizzes. They, we have sometimes set up some very specific things that tutors are working on with a specific client. Other times they are, um, Courtney or I are going just around the room as they raise their hand if there's, a con if there's something that they're not understanding. So that's, that's kind of how they get support, but mostly we find um, that you know, as adult learners, we like to learn at our own pace. We like to be able to go through that. Uh, they like to go through that at their own, at their own pace and um, you know, go back and forth between the Aztec and Study Island. So that's, uh, that's kind of how our quote-unquote classroom works. Yeah, that's really it's very seldom. It's very seldom that Courtney would be up in the um, front of a room unless she has, for example, three or four students that are specifically working on something like scientific method, for example. So she may uh, pull some out into a second classroom and go through at that time with a group of three or four. Um, but mostly they will be working independently. And I, I think, Kim, you and I have talked about this, and I've heard others who have your same role in other organizations have described this as like a one-room schoolhouse. So you have, may have a room full Absolutely. of students, but they're all at different levels and working on different things. And to me, that really sunk yeah. in when, when that was uh, expressed that way. And yeah, Jill, you put in the text chat. Go ahead. Did you have um, some, something you wanted to ask Kim? Yeah, um, I've got a question, particularly for any of our students who might be involved in the redesign of some of the modules that had been created during the pilot um, last semester. Um, one of the a, a constant. Um, feedback that we were getting from, um, I think Bonnie had um, said this as well, I had recognized it and so had several of my students, um, some of these one hour lessons were just jam packed with way too much information um, yeah. for it to be, you know, for somebody to really to be able to digest information within one hour and there was a lot of just text was just thrown on the slides. Um, and I don't want to create any more work for um, our, our student volunteers either, but if we come across as we're looking at some of these different topics, if it makes sense to, to develop, let's say, two one-hour lesson plans, so like your students could do something as like a part A one day and a part B the next, are you guys open to that or do you really just want the topics just narrowed down to one hour per topic and that's it? No, I'm fine with that. I'm fine if they break it up. If they have enough content for two one hour, I'm fine with that. Three one hour, okay. you know, whatever um, is, is needed for that. Yeah, we're fine with that. Wonderful. Thank you. And um, this actually might... Uh, and just so oh. everyone uh, knows, I am very open to any resources that you can find as far as additional uh, quizzes that we might be able to use, um, any of those type of resources, we're, we're open for you to send those as well. We're always searching, you know, searching through the Internet to see if we can find quizzes on the topics. Um, we would really appreciate it if there was an answer key with it so that we didn't have to go through <laughs> and uh, actually do it and create the answer key. So if any, anything that the students come across that way, we're, you know, we would love to have that as well. Yeah, and this is a perfect se um, segue into the slide about the um, additional design considerations. Idea of open educational resources. This is covered um, within the Jumpstart orientation materials. 
If you go to that section, um, section three of the Jumpstart, you'll see uh, where we link to the open educational resources the students found last semester. Um, you're very much encouraged to go find open educational resources that were created for a K-12 audience, probably most likely, and find ways to adapt those resources for your purposes. So it may be as simple as finding a video or finding a photograph or whatever it may be. It is not only just we'd like you to do that, you are really, really strongly encouraged to do that rather than reinventing the wheel because there's really some great stuff that's out there. If you have any questions about what, what I'm talking about with open educational resources, again, start with the Jumpstart material. Click over to the Creative Commons um, website and it will give you a sense for what the license looks like. Basically, we're looking for CC BY, which means you're just um, there's about the most liberal licensing you can get on on material, where all you have to do is attribute back to your original source, so you can adapt it as as much as you want. All of the materials we prepare are also released under that same license, so down the road others can um, take our materials and then um, adapt them as they feel um, they need to. So hopefully, that's about what I said the last time. So once you kind of do that, the other, other major thing we'd like you to think about as far as design consideration is conforming to the client style guide, which was produced by Bonnie Shellnut. Um, and I, I think Bonnie doesn't have her um, mic on. I haven't heard her yet. Um, it's brand new, hot off the press in the end of August. And Bonnie spent a lot of time doing this. As, it's kind of her baby, and I'm really, really thankful she did this because it's a ton of work she put into it. And it will give you a sense for um, what we're looking for in terms of the layout of your presentation as you lay things out, what fonts you should try to use. It's fairly basic, and it's basic on purpose. A uh, big initiative for us long term when we look down the next semesters is hopefully to be able to get some grant funding to, to do more refined development and use some more sophisticated tools. So in this initial iter iteration, these first things we're creating, we want something that's usable for Kim and Courtney now to be able to, to take and use and adapt um, for their purposes, which we've, we've all agreed probably, unfortunately, while it's somewhat boring, is to keep that on a PowerPoint platform. And it's also going to make it very easy for us, again, if, once we have some funding, and to be able to develop on a more sophisticated platform, to be able to take those artifacts that are created in PowerPoint and adapt it um, for uh, a more robust environment. Um, so any other thoughts or comments on that, Kim or, or Jill, as far as the style guide or this idea of you know, borrowing existing resources or whatever? Any thoughts on that besides my little soapbox? Yeah, did you have any thoughts or comments on the style guide, Bonnie? That's kind of where we were at. No, no, that's the one that uh, you, have, you, will have, you have posted and that they will use to uh, revise the uh, previously completed uh, PowerPoints and will be used to create the new ones. Are you creating a template from that style guide? Yeah, and so um, that was something we talked about when Bonnie produced it, that um, it may be the, the, the easier way is for me to go in and take a PowerPoint and make a template out of it. So that's kind of where we're at right now. And I know, Bonnie, I haven't, I haven't done that yet, but um, <laughs> I, think, I think that is a good idea is to have just it's so it, once you start reading the style guide, it, there's not a lot to it. it. It's very detailed in terms of what a lot of stuff we don't want to see um, to keep it nice and uh, consistent and plain. And so I, I started playing around with the template. I was like, well, there's not much here. It's, it's pretty straightforward, pretty common fonts and and things like that. So okay, um, well, I, I'm sorry we wasted the time when I had to redo my uh, thing there. Um, let's just go through this style guide real quick. It's PowerPoint based, as I mentioned. We're going for consistency, not necessarily splash. Um, again, the main focus is let's create something they can use right away and keep our eye toward something that would be easily adapted in the future as we have the uh, resources to be able to do more. Um, Jill, did you want to take a couple seconds maybe and walk them through the, um, the idea with the reflections and the deliverables so they don't have to just listen to me ramble on here if you've got your audio handy? Sure. Um, well, what we have done is um, one of the things that we talk about in instructional design is that it's really important as designers that we engage in reflective practice. And especially sometimes when we get lost in projects, if we've been spending a lot of time on a project, we don't always do a great job, I think, of taking a step back and taking a look at that, you know, do, having that, you know, 30,000 foot um, view looking down at what we're doing. And so 
one of the things that Jennifer and I want to do is we want to provide you with an opportunity um, to be able to take a step back periodically throughout this project this fall to kind of see where you're at, where are you struggling with challenges, might need to take a look at and refine. Um, I think some of the challenges that we can expect to come up is that we are, we're designing instruction for a vulnerable population, and so it's going to be very important that everything that we're designing, we want to make sure that we're not, we're providing relevant examples that the learners are going to understand. We don't want to insult their intelligence by using examples that are really too simple. You kind of have to have that balance. And so a lot of times our reflections are going to kind of be asking you, you know, do you have your learner um, as your center focus and are you, you know, is this really going to help the learner? Is this really going to um, drive, the, drive the learner through the instruction? Um, other um, challenges I think that you're going to see coming up are, is how can we embed interaction into these online learning modules and being able to embed interactive instructional strategies that, um, that the learners will be able to do on their own once we give these modules to Grace Centers of Hope. And we won't be there necessarily to be sitting there beside the learner walking them through some of the, some of these different interactive activities. Um, a challenge also arises too with, um, with the templates that we're using, we're that we're working with PowerPoint just because we talk about technological resources. And so with all these different things going on in the background, uh, Jennifer and I want to make sure that we're kind of touching base with you throughout, throughout this process to see, number one, have you come across anything? Have you had any epiphanies where there's uh, maybe new resources out there that none of us know about that we can integrate into this project or future projects for Designers for Learning? Also, how can we help you, even if it's just um, fact-checking, taking a, a, you know, having a second or third set of eyes um, on the materials that you're developing and designing? Um, if there's challenges with, um, with team members, um, not that we're anticipating any, but if, there, if there's a group and they're having a hard time um, coming to an agreement as to, you know, what's a good activity, we can kind of weigh in as well. And so that's really the purpose of the reflections. Um, we're planning on providing you with a lot of feedback and suggestions and giving you a lot of examples of things earlier on this fall. And then our goal really for your own personal development is that you're going to start seeing us taking a faded approach. And we're going to kind of be taking a step back more towards the end because we want to see how you're going to be developing and refining these activities as you move forward on the process. Perfect. And um, I think the, the schedule is pretty self-explanatory, but um, if anybody has any questions on that, again, send us a, a, a note. But the, the main deliverables for the team are, um, we're looking by October 13th. Well, first of all, let's take one step back. Jill and I will be reading Reflections next week, early next week, and hopefully by, like, let's say Wednesday, Thursday of next week, after everyone's submitted their Reflections, we've had a chance to read them. We'll, we'll send out the assignments, so you'll be assigned one of the six topics that are new or one of the um, revisions to the three. Again, you have the opportunity to kind of weigh in, on, and we'll try to accommodate folks as best as possible. So once the assignments are made, we're looking then for the first major deliverable for the teams to be the design plan. And it's all laid out in the jumpstart what we're looking for with that. Um, and then that's really your first opportunity to, con to articulate what your conception is of how the learner is going to walk through this lesson. What content will be covered? What instructional strategies are you incorporating to engage the learner with the content? What are the assessment strategies you've embedded? Um, and then we're going to have the opportunity, Bonnie, um, Kim, Courtney, um, Jill, and myself, and, and other, we're, we're also thinking about ways to incorporate maybe some of the faculty sponsors in some of these review session, review processes to then offer you feedback on things that you may want to think about to enhance your design as you move to that prototype stage. The, um, the prototype will be um, due on um, December 10th. And then that will, again, go through another round of review and feedback. And then Kim has also volunteered to have a couple of her learners um, do some type of pilot testing with it where they're actually going to be running through the lessons, seeing how it goes based on the prototype. So after that round of uh, formative evaluation and usability testing, we will then provide you the feedback that you will incorporate into the final deliverable, which is due on December 8th. And so I think Kim and... Jill, does that pretty much, I mean, it lays it out about as well as I can in five minutes, right? Absolutely. Okay. Sounds yeah, good. Sounds good. Um, and then for those that may be wondering, this is where we stored all of our resources during the first iteration of the project. 
It was a Weebly site. Again, everything, oh, I, I kind of meant, I, I probably said it when I was on mute before, but um, we have no budget. So back to our design considerations, <laughs> back to bullet point number one here. Uh, we, we have no budget. And so everything we do, we do with uh, freely available resources. And so one of the big reasons we use this Weebly site is because it was free. And this is not where we envision our permanent home. But if you poke around there, I think it helps to give you a sense of how we're kind of thinking this may look as we go through various design iterations of how we're going to store all this content and how the students will be able to access it. This was done by um, Eric Ludwig. He's from um, University of Colorado at Denver, one of the service learners last year put this together. And I think it kind of gives you a nice visual conceptual conceptualization of how this could lay out where the students go to a particular section, they click on it, the resource comes up, and, and off they go. Um, so the, again, this won't be a permanent home, but I think if you poke around there and get a sense for what the thought process is well, of how your piece will fit into a bigger piece of the puzzle, I think it's kind of helpful. Um, next steps. I know some of the students, these are very, and I'm sorry, Kim, you have to endure this, and if you need to go, I, I totally understand. I only have like three more minutes, but there are some students who are looking for this experience to fulfill an internship or a course credit or whatever it may be. While we are offering a letter of recognition that you can use at the end of this, after you successfully complete this experience, if you need more, if there's particular forms you need us to fill out as facilitators, if you could let us know that pretty quickly, because there may be other things you need to do that we need to make sure you're doing or track. Um, so the sooner we know that, the better. Last semester was awesome. We had probably six, seven, eight students who used this experience either in an internship or a practicum or a course requirement. Um, but what I found is at the end, there was a you know slew of paperwork that I maybe wasn't aware of or I didn't know what I needed to be tracking and working with you on. So if you could let us know that, um, that would be great. We're also working, Jason, I mentioned earlier, we're trying to figure out ways to incorporate badging in two components, one being badging for the work you're doing, the service work you're doing, also trying to figure out ways that we can incorporate badging as part of our design of these instructional modules. And so if you have any experience in this or interest, this may be a side project that you could work on. I'm just kind of throwing that out there to folks. If you're interested and have done any digital badging, just let me know and we'll try to work something out on, um, on that end. And then I think this is getting close to my, some of my last comments. We are going to AECT, which is, as everyone on this call probably knows, that's our big, um, our big conference in, um, in Florida this year. So if you're going to be there, please let us know. We're going to have an exhibit booth that will be running through the whole thing. And then we also have three sessions that we're, we're all participating in. Jill and I are doing a service learning workshop. We have a design showcase. Uh, we also have a panel. So certainly anyone who's on this call right now, if you're going to AECT, you're very much welcome to figure out ways you can help interact with us and participate with us while we're there, particularly probably within the design showcase, because that's an opportunity where you'd be able to stand there and talk to folks as they come up. So just let me know if you're going to be at AACT, and, um, and we'll figure something out. Um, kind of re repeating ground here, but the next big steps are getting your assignments next week. Keep, please keep an eye out for those news updates that are going to be posted on the website. And um, feel free at any time to post questions in the forum or send us an in, in email. Um, and I think that's pretty much all I had besides my final thank you. Kim or Jill, anything else before we wind down here? You, you guys good? No, just again, thank you, thank you. <laughs> okay, very thank you. good. In advance for everybody's hard work that they're going to be doing for this. That's great. I greatly appreciate it. Yeah, thanks everybody for your time today as well. This will be recorded. I'll edit out that big <laughs> muted area and post it if you want to go back and listen. And uh, thanks to everybody for, for joining us. We'll, we'll see you next time, probably in a couple weeks. We try to do these every other week or so just to get everybody on the same page. Okay, thanks okay, thank everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye now. Recording of the conference has stopped. I did. That was crazy. I wonder what I, how I must have muted everybody. I will have to work on that next time. Well, thanks everybody who's still on. We'll see you soon. I'm going to, I'm going to leave. Bye-bye. You are the only participant.